Good evening, everybody, and welcome to a very special lecture series. If everybody can hear me, please give us a shout out in the chat to make sure the technology is working well. It's the first time we've had a virtual webinar in just a little bit. We want to make sure, first of all, I am unmuted, which is awesome. <laughs> and second of all, make sure you all are good. Excellent. All right, folks. Well, welcome. Uh, my name is Paige Engelbrexen, and although you may not be able to see them, with me is my coworker, Winter Gary. We work for the Highlands Biological Foundation, which supports natural history research and education in the Southern Appalachians. A key topic for both of these areas is climate change. So in order to address this very important idea, we are broadening our programming to include this new lecture series. For the next three weeks, we'll be inviting field researchers who have worked in the region to share their findings and what they suggest for how climate change has been, is, and may in the future impact our area. Throughout their presentations, please feel free to leave comments and questions in the chat box and the Q&A. After the presentation, Winner and I will be moderating a Q&A session for the remainder of our time together. While I don't expect that it will be an issue, I do want to say up front that as an organization that supports science, we are not here to debate whether or not climate change is happening. It is a reality. We are here to ask what will it change and how will we mitigate it? Our book club this past year addressed that second question and the series aims to answer the first. As part of that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Richard Chandler to the webinar. Dr. Chandler is an Associate Professor of Wildlife Ecology and Conservation at the University of Georgia's Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources. He received a BS in Wildlife Biology at the University of Vermont and his Master's and PhD in Wildlife Conservation at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Dr. Chandler's research aims to understand how environmental change influences spatial population dynamics in order to inform wildlife conservation efforts. Growing up outside of Chattanooga, Tennessee, he has spent a great deal of time in Western North Carolina, and he has a long-standing fondness for the fauna of the Southern Appalachians. Dr. Chandler. Thank you, Paige, so much for that introduction. And uh, thanks to all of you out there for tuning in to this presentation. I'm gonna go ahead and try to share my screen and, and get started. Okay, can everyone see that okay? Oops, let me flip that around. How does that look, Winter? Does that look good? Okay, great. Okay, so today I'm gonna to be talking about uh, eight years of research that I've been involved with, um, very close to Highlands, uh, in and around the Coweta uh, Hydrologic Lab Laboratory. And the focus of the research is on trailing edge population dynamics. So trailing edge populations are populations at the receding edge of a shifting range. So what we're looking at here on the left, so this is a, the range map for a Canada warbler. So the area shown in orange here is the breeding range. And you can see that most of it up is, is up in Canada and the Northeastern United States but there's a small sliver of the range that comes all the way down as far south as Northeastern Georgia. And so the trailing edge populations are these populations in the Northern hemisphere, they're the populations at the southernmost edge of the range. And we know that many the ranges of many species are shifting north with climate change. And so we're interested in exactly what is happening with these southernmost populations what's causing them to shift or in some cases decline and become locally extinct. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna focus on in my talk today. But I'd like to begin by first acknowledging my co-authors and especially Dr. Bob Cooper, who uh, is a professor here at the University of Georgia and has been working in this region with black-throated blue warblers since 2002. Um, Bob has been a great collaborator over the years, and he's the one that generously invited me to um, work with him on this project. I'd also like to thank the many graduate students. They're the ones that are out there actually as we speak right now that do a lot of the work collecting the data and pushing these projects along. So I wanna thank especially Sam Merker. A lot of the research I'm gonna, results I'm gonna be showing today were collected by Sam. 
as well as Will Lewis and Heather Gaia. Those are the other grad students that have been working on the project. Okay, so the outline for my talk, I'm gonna just start by emphasizing how unique the Southern Appalachian Mountains are in terms of how many trailing edge populations occur here. And then I'm gonna talk about a cross-site comparison of work that's been done on black-throated blue warblers down here at Coweta, as well as um, up at, in New Hampshire at the Hubbard Brook Long-Term Research Station. And then what I wanna focus on is the factors that are limiting the distributions of trailing edge populations. So for these species that I'm gonna be talking about today, they're really restricted to the highest elevations, the coolest, wettest climates in the region. And we wanna know why, what keeps them up at those high elevations? What prevents them from occurring in these warmer, uh, drier conditions at lower elevations? And if we can understand those questions, then we can understand how climate change is impacting these populations. So the limiting factors that I'm gonna talk about today include phys physiological constraints on egg development. So we wanna know if there's something about egg, the eggs themselves that are negatively impacted by warmer conditions, drier conditions, all right? Um, another limiting factor, so this seems to be on auto advance for some reason. Um, Sorry about that. But another factor we're gonna look at is um, pathogens. So if you're familiar with the Hawaiian avifauna, you know that uh, avian malaria at low elevations has decimated the Hawaiian avifauna. And so now many species are restricted to the highest elevations in Hawaii. And some people have suggested that that same phenomenon might happen in mountains in North America. So it's possible that some of these populations are restricted to high elevations because of pathogens like blood parasites that occur at lower elevations. So we'll talk about some research on that. And then another hypothesis that has been put forward to explain why these populations, these trailing edge populations are restricted to high elevations where it's cool and wet is that there's competition with other species that are warm adapted at lower elevations. So you might think of species like hooded warblers that do quite well at lower elevations, perhaps they're competing with these high elevation species and that's why they're restricted to the higher elevations. Okay, so after that, I'm gonna talk about some work that we're doing to take all this information we're gathering and try to forecast into the future what's gonna to happen to the abundance and distribution of these populations. Okay, so to begin with the diversity of trailing edge populations in the Southern Appalachians, one of the reasons this area is so fascinating to me is that there's so many species that have range maps like this. Okay, and so if I were to quiz you here and ask you what species do you think this range map belongs to, you're likely, some of you might be able to recognize it right away, but it, you're likely to struggle because there are so many species across so many taxonomic groups that have a range that looks just like this, okay? And so in this case, uh, <laughs> it's out of advancing, um, but in this case, it's kind of a trick question because I'm gonna be talking about birds, but this is actually the range map of the yellow birch. So this is a tree, the yellow birch that many of you are familiar with, but notice how this range map looks very similar to the range map of the Canada warbler that we looked at earlier, with most of the range up in Canada and the Northeastern United States, and um, a small sliver again extending down the mountains in Western North Carolina, Tennessee, and Georgia. So let's look at some of the other species. So here's the black-throated blue warbler that I'll be talking more about later. And again, notice the range. Okay, very similar trailing edge populations down here in the southeast. And this map over on the left in the bottom left hand corner of the screen is breeding bird survey map. So this is a trend map showing changes in the population over time. And what you see is that again in the southern part of the range, you see population declines. Okay, so let's look at a few other species. Here's the Canada warbler one of these species that we work with closely in and around Coweta. 
uh, again, restricted the highest elevations and you see population declines again here in Western North Carolina. Another species with a very similar range map, black-throated green warbler, black Bernian warbler. Okay, let me see if I can turn this auto advance off. That's gonna drive me crazy. I apologize. Let me um, let me try this again. Well, hopefully that'll stop it. Um, but again, if you just look through um, species after species, it's an impressive list of birds that have a similar distribution like black burning warbler, like chestnut sided warbler, um, with, uh, that are restricted to high elevations in the Southern Appalachians and that are declining uh, in our region. Here's another species. This is a golden wing warbler. This is a species. This is a picture I took uh, in Costa Rica. I studied this uh, migratory bird during the non breeding season in Costa Rica. So we have to remember that a lot of these species, they're not just impacted by conditions on, in North America, but they overwinter in Central America and South America as well. Another species, the beery. Rough grouse has a similar distribution as well. Winter wren. Uh, dark-eyed junco, and it's not just birds. So if you look at this range map for snowshoe hare, this is very outdated. Snowshoe hare actually used to occur in the Smokies. Now the farthest south they get is West Virginia. Um, <clears throat> but if you look at this species, it has a similar distribution, woodland jumping mouse, and I could just go on and on and on with species that have these similar ranges. We could look at plants, we could look at dragonflies. It goes on and on and on, okay? So many species have their southernmost range limit right in this area of the Highlands Biological Station. So uh, one thing that we wanted to do is, you know, we see this when we look at range maps, but we wanted to assess um, how the Southern Appalachians compare to other regions of the world. So one of my graduate students, Sam Merker, collected all of the range maps for all of the terrestrial bird species of the world. And what he did was he took each range map and he clipped out the low latitude portion of each range, okay? So you take the whole range, you clip out in the Northern hemisphere, just that southernmost part of the range. And then you stack all of those on top of each other for all of the species, okay? And you wind up with a map like this that highlights so this color scale here highlights how many species have a range, um, have the southernmost part of the range in a particular area, okay? And so we see some hot spots all around the world. If we zoom in just to North America, we see that indeed the Southern Appalachian Mountains do light up, okay? So notice that there's about 20 to 25 species of birds in the Southern Appalachians that have their southernmost range limit here. So this is one of the things that makes the region of Western North Carolina, um, Northeast Georgia unique. You know, we often think about it being unique because there's so many endemic species like the salamanders that occur at high elevations. But this is another unique aspect of the fauna of the Southern Appalachian Mountains, this high diversity of trailing edge populations. And it's not just that there's a large number of species with trailing edge populations here. We also see that it's a high proportion of the total avifauna. So it's close to 20, 25% of all of the birds during the breeding season that occur here are trailing edge populations. Okay, so what threats face trailing edge populations? Well, many of these species depend on early successional habitat. We know that's a concern. If you think about rough grouse, uh, golden wing warbler, that's a concern in the issue. I'm sure everyone is familiar with the loss of American chestnut. Uh, we're uh, 
Carolina hemlock, eastern hemlock suffering from hemlock woody adelgid. Um, and then steep slope development is another concern. There's rapid development in the region. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, there's events during the non-breeding season. But what I wanna focus on today is climate change, okay? And how climate change might be affecting these populations at the southernmost part of their range. So if we look at the 2018 National Climate Assessment for the region, you can see historical data on plant hardiness zones. And if you look at our region, Southern Appalachians, you see that many of these are in this 5B, 6A, 6B zone currently. But what our forecasts tell us is that in the, over the course of the century, we're likely to lose all of those uh, cold tolerant zones. And that's likely to impact the plant, the, the plant communities in these areas upon which birds and other wildlife depend. If we look at data, not just forecasts, but actual data from Coweta, here we're looking at mean air temperature during the period when many of these birds breed in the area, so April to August. And you see a clear trend of increasing uh, air temperatures starting around the 70s in this region. Climate change is not happening as rapidly in other parts of the world as like if you think about in the poles where it's happening at a much uh, in the Arctic where it's happening at a much faster rate, but there is a clear signature of increasing temperatures in this region. If you look at precipitation patterns from Coweta, you don't see a clear trend. However, what you do see is more variability. It's a little bit hard to see in this graph, but you see compared to the early years, you see more years with extremely low precipitation and then extremely high precipitation. And so another way to look at that is if you look at the variance, the variability in precipitation, that has gone up over time. So we see an increasing trend in temperature and we see a more variable, uh, we see more variable precipitation conditions, okay? I'm gonna try to share this a different way so it's not jumping so much. Please excuse me, uh, did not anticipate this to happen. Dr. Chandler, it's all good. Technology gets the best of all of us. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I've never had this happen before. Um, Absolutely no worries. In the meantime, folks, if you do have any questions that are starting to percolate, feel free to drop them in the chat or the Q&A. We will be using those in the last part of the program. I know I've already come up with a few. Great, well, I apologize again. I'm not sure I see a way to stop the auto advance on here. Um, but I'm gonna carry on. So um, we see from the temperature and precipitation data, the clear signature of climate change. Um, and people have used that information not only to predict what's gonna to happen to plant hardiness zones, but also what's gonna to happen to the ranges of these species that I've been talking about. And so here's a model uh, that was developed for the Canada warbler by USDA. And so here's the current distribution. So what you see is highest abundance or density or occurrence probability up in uh, New England, up in Maine. And the, the population that's fairly contiguous all the way down to Northeast Georgia. But what's expected to happen is as warming condition uh, continues um, and as precipitation becomes more variable, these populations are predicted to become more and more restricted to the higher elevation. So the range is gonna shift northward and upward in elevation. So that gives us concern because if this continues for long enough, it's possible that we're gonna lose, we're not talking about losing the entire species in any time in the next century, but we might lose very important population segments like the populations in the Southern Appalachian Mountains. And one reason that that's concerning is first, uh, everyone loves their birds in this region. Birding is a billion dollar industry annually actually, but 
there's other reasons, biological reasons to be concerned about this. Um, we did a, a sort of a preliminary genetic study where we compared the genetics of Canada warbler populations here in Western North Carolina to a population in New Hampshire, to a population that's actually north of where Canada warblers are even, were even thought to occur up in the Northwest Territories. And what our results indicated was that this North Carolina trailing edge population is extremely, is genetically distinct from both of the Northern populations. And in fact, the New Hampshire population was more similar to the population in the Northwest Territories genetically than it was to the Coweta population. And we've seen this for many other species where we see uh, unique genetics of these trailing edge Southern populations. And that's partially because these are the older populations that survived during uh, in, in glacial refugia during periods of uh, when the glaciers were much farther south. These populations to the north, you can think of as newer populations that colonized much more recently and are not as genetically diverse as our southern trailing edge populations. Okay, so now I'm gonna dive in. Uh, talked about the diversity of trailing edge populations in the region. Now I'm gonna talk about this long-term data on black-throated blue warblers that Bob Cooper has been collecting in New Hampshire and that Scott Silla and others have been collecting um, at the Harbor Brook site. And so <clears throat> the hypothesis that we're assessing here is, has several predictions. So if, if climate change is actually going to impact these populations and cause rain shifts, what we'd expect to see is that density, so how, how many birds per unit area are in a particular location, should be correlated with climate. So we would expect to see higher densities of the species in cooler climates, lower densities in warmer climates. We would also expect to see population declines happening primarily at the southern populations, the trailing edge populations, and especially at the low elevations where they're in the warmer conditions. So we have this long-term data from these two sites, Hubbard Brook, Coweta. The birds actually look a bit different. So for those of you familiar with black-throated blue warblers, in, in the south, they have these blacker backs. Um, you can visually tell a southern bird from a northern bird uh, based on the plumage. And at each of the two sites, North Carolina and New Hampshire, uh, three long-term plots were established. So a low elevation plot, a mid elevation plot, and a high elevation plot at each site. So we can look at latitudinal differences as well as elevational differences, which elevation is kind of a proxy for climate. It's obviously cooler the higher elevation. And we have mark recapture data starting in 2002. So that's data where we put uniquely, uh, uh, unique uh, aluminum bands on each bird that we capture. And that allows us to track them year after year and determine are they surviving, uh, how are new birds entering the population. And that allows us to study the demography of the populations. So to zoom in a little bit more, uh, for those of you from the area, you're familiar with Otto. It's not too far from Highlands. These are our three study sites. So this is the low elevation site on the east of 441. Here's the mid elevation site, about 1,200 meters. Uh, and there's the high elevation site, which is very close to the top of uh, Mount Albert. And so let's dig into the, some of the results. And so indeed, when we take our results and we estimate density, at each of the six sites, we see exactly what we would predict in terms of density goes up when you go from the low elevation site to the mid elevation site to the high elevation site at both the range margins, so that's here in Coweta, as well as at the range core in Hubbard Brook. Now, when we um, look at trends, Okay, not just density at a snapshot in time, but when we look at trends, let's start over here with the range core. What you see is a lot of variability from one year to the next, but you don't see a strong trend like long-term decline or a long-term increase. They're fairly stable 
towards the core of the range in New Hampshire. However, when you look at Coweta, the low elevation plot declined quite precipitously. Okay, in fact, around 2000, I believe it was 2010, the population got so low, there were just a couple females, one or two females left on the plot that Dr. Cooper and others, there's also a hard plot to access, but they abandoned the site because it just wasn't worth all the effort to get in there to do the research anymore. So the low elevation plot uh, effectively went locally extinct. Uh, we've, we continue to go in there and check on it every once in a while. And there's, as before, maybe one, sometimes we go in there and there's not a single black or blue warbler left at that low elevation plot. So that one declined the fastest. But our mid-elevation plot, which we have continuous mark recapture data, um, grad students are out there working right now at this plot, it has also shown a decline, okay? And so there's long-term trend in the density of black coated blue water rulers at this site as well. So these results are very much consistent with what we would expect if climate change is impacting these populations, where clearly density is correlated with climate and the population declines are happening at the lowest latitudes and at the lowest elevation sites in the so in the warmer drier conditions so this is one way by which the range might shift right so there's going to be fewer birds at the lower elevations um, at the middle elevations and eventually many of these populations might be restricted to the highest elevations in the region and at some point there's not going to be any ability there will be no more ability or capacity for them to move up slope anymore so what we want to do now is try to dig in deeper and understand why might these populations be declining. All right. And so what this uh, graph is showing is average territory size per male at those three long term sites uh, here around Coweta. And so at the high elevation site, we don't see much of a trend in density, and we also don't see much of a trend in territory size. However, at the mid elevation plot, we see a slight increase in territory size. And at the low elevation plot, those territories started to get very large. And what that tends to suggest in wildlife populations is that when territory sizes get large, it suggests that prey availability or food resources are going down. Okay, as, as food resources go down, the, the birds in this case have to use more area to meet their requirements. And so, Dr. Cooper and others have also been collecting data on the prey of these species, which are largely arthropods and primarily uh, caterpillars, so Lepidoptera larvae. All right, and so, oops, let me skip ahead to this one. And so what you see is here at the low elevation site when they were still working actively, there was evidence that caterpillar biomass was declining at this low elevation site. So that's one potential explanation for why um, these populations was declining. Somehow climate was influencing the uh, arthropods, perhaps causing arthropod numbers to go down, which is why the bird population uh, responded as it did. Another bit of evidence that this might, part of the puzzle might be uh, associated with food is that we also have been observing decreases in nestling mass. So we find the nests of all these species and we measure the mass of the nestlings. And there's been negative trends in nestling mass at both uh, North Carolina site and at the range core up in New Hampshire. Again, suggesting that food resources might partially explain this population decline. Okay, so that's one uh hypothesis that we've been exploring perhaps food climate is impacting these populations via effects on food resources but another there's many hypotheses uh, another potential is that physiology plays a role so perhaps these cool adapted these trailing edge populations which occur in these cool wet climates perhaps physiologically they're unable to cope with the warmer conditions and it's unlikely that physiological effects would directly affect the adults themselves, because we know that they can withstand cold temperatures and hot temperatures um, because they're migrating across the globe. Um, 
But where we would expect to see it most strongly is with the eggs. Okay, so eggs are highly specialized in, in terms of um, the pore density, essentially. And so in different climates, bird eggs have different pore densities, which regulate water loss and oxygen transfer. Okay, so what we wanted to know was, would the eggs of these cool adapted species be able to hatch? So would the embryos be able to develop and hatch at, in warmer, drier conditions? Okay, so you can't move the birds down to lower, drier conditions, but you can experimentally move the eggs, okay? <clears throat> the trick is, if you wanna move back black-throated blue warbler eggs down to uh, lower elevations, there's no black-throated blue warblers there. However, there are hooded warblers there. And the nests of hooded warblers and black-throated blue warblers look nearly identical. They're very, very similar in terms of their height, their construction, the material they're used. And these two species ecologically are just extremely similar overall. So what we did is we, we came up with this reciprocal transplant experiment where we decided to take eggs from black-throated blue warblers, move them down to low elevations, put them in hooded warbler nests, and take hooded warbler eggs and move them up high to the cooler climates at the top of the mountain to see what, uh, if indeed, hatch rates are impacted by warmer, drier conditions. Our main interest was on the black-throated blue warblers. And so what you would predict if this hypothesis is true is that hatch rates should go down for the black-throated blue warblers when you move them to the warmer conditions if they are indeed sensitive to climate conditions. So Sam Merker, again, my graduate student, this was an extremely difficult experiment to pull off. You not only have to find nests, which is very difficult, but you have to find nests of two species that are at the same point in their development. So there's basically, as soon as the clutch is laid, you have to have two nests that are in that exact same state of two different species at two different elevations, and then find those eggs and quickly make the swap. So he was able to do this for many nests. Uh, here he is taking the eggs from one nest, they pack them in the car and, and book it down the mountain, uh, swap the eggs, and then they put this little, um, what's called an eye button. It's a device that records temperature and humidity within the nest to verify that in fact, the, the climate conditions are different. <clears throat> Many other aspects of this study uh, that I'd be happy to answer questions about later. But this was the idea, you swap the nest, the eggs, we put little, while the eggs are gone, we put fake eggs in the nest. The birds are well known to incubate fake eggs. So they, they don't really know that this is happening at all. Um, okay. And in fact, they do continue to, they did continue to incubate as normal after we made the swaps. So what did we find? Well, really to our surprise, you know, a lot of the hypotheses we evaluate are, are hypotheses that we don't really think are likely to explain the, the patterns we're observing but we, you have to go through and evaluate each of them one by one. Um, this was one we thought, you know, I, I think it's probably more food, um, but let's check out this physiological explanation. And to our surprise, we found a very strong effect. So the hatch rate of black-throated blue warblers, so here's in the unmanipulated nest, so just regular nests that we don't do any manipulation to, is over 95%, or around 95%. However, in the experimental treatment, so when these eggs were moved down to these lower, warmer, drier conditions, hatch rates went down to about 60%. So that's a major difference, um, suggesting that, in fact, these eggs are adapted to the cooler, wetter conditions and may not be able to cope with warmer conditions, drier conditions, like we're seeing um, in the data from the Coweta uh, weather stations. <clears throat> However, if you look at the hooded warblers, hooded warblers, there's some evidence that they're already starting to move up slope, and they seem to be fairly insensitive, okay? So in both the control, unmanipulated groups, and in the uh, swap groups, hatch rates were always around 80% or higher, okay? So this is suggestive that, in fact, 
a physiological mechanism may be at play. So if it warms up, it's possible that that might negatively impact hatch rates, which might negatively impact the populations. So we're starting to dig in and try to understand what might be causing the population declines that we're seeing uh, in the Southern Appalachians. Okay, so that's another hypothesis we evaluated. Um, moving on to the next one, I mentioned pathogens and I talked for briefly about um, the Hawaiian avifauna and everyone's, or many people are familiar with avian malaria there that was introduced by humans and really devastated the Hawaiian avifauna. Many of those species are become extinct. The ones that are left are restricted to the highest elevations because mosquitoes don't occur, uh, or at least are much rarer at the higher elevations and don't transmit malaria. <clears throat> so some people have hypothesized that that same type of process might be happening in other regions. So it's possible that birds in the Southern Appalachians, one reason why so many of them might be restricted to higher elevations is because of pathogens that occur at low elevations. And one group of pathogens that is known to affect bird populations are blood parasites. So what we've done is we've gone out and we've collected blood samples across the climate gradient. So from the cooler wet areas down to the warmer areas for many species. And we make little blood smears, put them under the microscopes and we determine whether or not there's blood parasites in each of these samples from each of these birds. These are just a couple of the examples of different blood parasites that we see uh, when we're looking through the microscope. So a couple results here. First, one pattern that was again rather striking to us was that you do see a much higher infection rate in the warm adapted species. So the species at the lower elevations and in the warmer conditions and a lower infection rate in these cool adapted species up at higher elevations, okay? So that's suggestive that there may be differences in pathogen prevalence, so blood parasite prevalence uh, over the climate grade. And so this could be a benefit, one reason why species have adapted to occur in these higher elevations in these cooler climates. But it's possible that you know, birds have high infection rates, but it really doesn't influence them. There's no lethal effects. There's no effects on the distribution. So what we wanted to see is once we've been able to estimate the infection rates across the climate gradient, we wanna know whether or not the probability of being infected with a parasite influences the probability of occurrence uh, at that location. And so here are some results from that analysis, where again, we have a cool adapted species, trailing edge population, the black throated blue warbler, and the other species that we had enough data for was a warm adapted species, the wood thrush. And what you see here is a very strong relationship between the probability of infection and the probability of occurrence. So what this suggests is that the distribution of this species is strongly influenced by the distribution of the pathogens. So in areas where there's high pathogen prevalence, this species is much less likely to occur than in areas where probability of infection is quite low. That's where you find black-throated blue warblers to be more abundant, okay? So this is a link between the distribution of the pathogens and the distribution of these species, suggesting that if the distribution of the pathogens shift with climate change. So we know mosquito populations are moving, uh, advancing with warming climates. That might be another way by which these populations or trailing edge populations are negatively impacted by climate change. For the warm adapted species, the wood thrush, the effect is much weaker. Okay, so there's a suggests a slight negative effect of uh, infection probability on occurrence. But you notice these confidence intervals are very wide. Uh, it's not a statistically significant effect. Okay, so those are two of the hypotheses that we dug in a bit deeper with. Um, uh, the physiological effects and the effects of pathogens. Now I wanna talk about another one, which is competition. So many people have suggested that 
the reason why some of these cool adapted species are restricted to higher elevations is because they're out competed by species that occur at the warmer, uh, lower elevations. And so we wanted to assess that hypothesis uh, looking at two potential competitors. In this case, we're gonna focus on the Canada warbler. Again, a cool adapted species, most of the population. If you ask a Canadian, they don't even know that Canada warblers occur in North Carolina. They think that it's a Canadian species or their bird. But in fact, we do have them in Georgia um, and they're quite abundant at the high elevations in North Carolina. But we wanted to know, are they uh, limited by the distribution of hooded warblers? And you can see the hooded warbler is a warm adapted species. It's abundant throughout the Southeast. So if hooded warblers, this is the predictions from this hypothesis, if hooded warblers limit the range of Canada warblers, you would expect that local extinction probability should be higher for Canada warblers when hooded warblers show up. So if, if, if Canada warbler is in a high elevation location and a hooded warbler shows up, you would expect the Canada warblers to become locally extinct following that event. Similarly, you would not expect Canada warblers to colonize areas that are already inhabited by hooded warblers. You would also expect, not necessarily, but for certain types of competition, you'd expect to see some type of aggression between the two species. Okay, so how did we evaluate these predictions? Well, what you're looking at right here is a map of the Coweta Basin on the right to the east here, uh, shown in green. And the higher elevations, so 1400 meters, are shown in the wider, lighter colors. So again, here's Mount Albert to orient you. Here's the Coweta Basin to the east of that. Each of these crosses represents a location where we go out and do surveys, point count surveys, where we count all the birds that we see in here every year. Okay, the red circles indicate locations where we find hooded warblers and the blue locations are where we find Canada warblers. So you can see that the Canada warblers are restricted to the high elevations. Hooded warblers are more, more often found at the lower elevations. Sometimes they co-occur. So what happens? You know, we go out year after year. That was 2014, here's 2015. Um, you can see that the distribution is similar, Hoodham's low down, Canada's up high. 2016, we got a grant, we were able to hire more people, we're surveying more locations, um, but the pattern remains the same, okay? Our eyes aren't very good though at determining how these two species are interacting from looking at this. So we have to do some analysis, analyses over these data. And when we do, what we find is that on the y-axis here, we're gonna have occurrence probability. So the probability that a species occurs at a particular location. And on the x-axis, we have our climate gradient. So to the left is the cooler, wetter areas. To the right is the warmer, drier areas. And we see again, a very strong signal of climate impacts on the distribution of these two species. So clearly year after year, Canada warblers are uh, occurrence probability is much higher at the cooler, wetter locations, it goes down as you go into the warmer locations. And the opposite pattern is true for hooded warblers. However, we see almost no effect of hooded warblers on the distribution of Canada warblers. So you see the solid blue line. So that's locations where there are hooded warblers is almost identical to the dash line where there's locations without hooded warblers. So there's really, after you account for the climate effect, there appears to be very little influence of hooded warblers on Canada warblers, okay? But that's observational data, okay? And, and correlation doesn't always imply causation. And so what we like to do is follow up observational studies like that with experiments. And so a friend of a friend was a wood carver. And so what we did was we asked them to carve some decoys of these two species. So I think that looks pretty good. There's a, there's a wooden decoy of a Canada warbler. There's a wooden decoy of a, a hooded warbler. And so what we were able to do is use these decoys to simulate territory intrusion. intrusion. So we wanted to know what happens if you put a Canada warbler right smack dab in the middle of a hooded warbler territory. Is there any evidence of aggression? Okay. 
So we did this with 60 different trials. We used Carolina chickadees as a control. We did these over the climate gradient. And what I want to show you briefly is just a little video. Some people may say, eh, those, those decoys aren't bad, but I don't think a bird is going to believe that that's a real bird. So let me, let me show you uh, that that's actually not the case. Um, <clears throat> so what we're going to look at here is a real brief video done on a phone by Sam Merker, who's hiding in a bush. Uh, so not the best photo quality. But what you have right here, um, towards the upper center of this screen is one of those uh, hooded warbler decoys. Okay, it's a hooded warbler decoy that's put in a hooded warbler territory. So same species, just to see if the hooded warbler in fact recognizes this decoy as a hooded warbler. And so what happens? We put the decoy in there, we do some playback. Does the bird buy it or not? So what you see right here, is that hooded warbler absolutely viciously attacking this decoy? <laughs> Let me play it again. So he's sitting on top of it, he's pecking it in the head. And right here, he flies up and dive bombs it, just absolutely smashes right into that decoy, going for the kill punch to the jugular. <laughs> so, there's no doubt at all that um, these decoys are, from the bird's perspective, um, appear to be real birds, okay? However, when we did the experiment, we did the swap, when you put a Canada warbler in a hooded warbler territory, they just completely ignore it. So if you put hooded in hooded, they attack, but if you put Canada in hooded, they ignore it. Same if you put hooded warbler and a Canada warbler, they completely disregard the other species. So this is more evidence against the competition hypothesis, that it doesn't appear as though Canada warblers are restricted to high elevations because of competition with hooded warblers, which is good because hooded warblers appear to be expanding into the higher elevations. And that suggests that there will not be a negative impact of that species on Canada. So we eliminate these predictions that uh, stem from that hypothesis. And we basically put this uh, competition hypothesis aside. Okay, so we're doing that for many other hypotheses. We kind of go through our list of explanations of how climate might impact these populations and cause declines. The other thing that we're doing is trying to take all of this information, all this data that we're gathering and putting it all together and forecasting what's likely to happen to these trailing edge populations into the future. So to do that, we collect many other types of data. Uh, this is again, a map showing the study area. Green is sort of the lower elevations, higher elevations here. The dots here are our point count survey locations, which are good for assessing abundance, but we don't get any demographic data. These red crosses here are mist net locations. So we now have about 20 sites where we go out and mist net every year to get mark recapture data, which allows us to estimate survival, recruitment, movement, so all the key demographic parameters. And then these rectangles are the demographic plots where Bob Cooper has been working since 2002, where we still go out and band and find the nests of every single black throated blue warbler on these plots year after year. Here's an example of one of those 12 meter long mist nets. Getting those through the rhododendron is a challenge, um, but the grad students are very good at it. And we have 20 of these nets at each site. And then here we are uh, banding these birds, all right? <clears throat> so the grad students are up there right now waking up sometimes at 4.30 a.m. every day to get these, collect these data. We put all this together and what we're able to do is look at how uh, population parameters like survival and recruitment are related to the climate gradient. That's kind of a proxy here by elevation. And we can take that and we can develop models to predict what's happening 
to density. So this map now shows density of Canada warblers. You see it's very low at low elevations, higher at high elevations. And we can do this, estimate spatial variation and density for each year. And when you scroll through 2014 to 15 to 16, PowerPoint is possessed here. Um, but you can see again, more evidence that, that the range is contracting for the Canada warbler. And so that gives us this ability to figure out where are the areas where we still have high density? What's the rate of loss? How much time do we have into the future before we might uh, lose uh, species like Canada warblers in certain areas like this around Coweta? <clears throat> okay, so to wrap up, Southern Appalachian Mountains are indeed a hot spot for diversity of trailing edge populations, the southernmost populations. There's mounting evidence that these populations are genetically distinct from northern populations. And we have evidence of population declines caused by climate change. What we really want to know is how climate impacts these populations, because in order to conserve them, we need to understand what the mechanism is. How is it that climate is impacting these populations? And so what we have now is evidence that prey might be an important component. Okay, so there could be uh, decreases in prey availability. Pathogens might play a role. Uh, another example of this, there's a lot of concern of uh, West Nile virus impacts on rough grouse. Uh, and West Nile virus, again, is thought to be more common at the lower elevation. So if it moves up higher, could have negative impacts on rough grouse, as well as many of these other songbirds I've been talking about. And then physiology. So, um, you know, with that egg experiment, there's some evidence that warming, warmer conditions are going to negatively impact uh, processes like embryo development and egg hatch rates. Some of the hypotheses that are not supported include competition. Uh, there's been some others that we've eliminated, like Ali effects. We don't think those are important. Not talking about that today. But this is what we're trying to do is go through this list, do these detailed studies using observational data and experiments to drill down and figure out how is climate impacting these populations. And hopefully that will give us some ideas for how we can think about implementing conservation strategies. Are there ways of doing habitat manipulation to increase prey availability, to, pr to protect microclimates that are not warming as fast as certain areas. Things like that uh, are ultimately gonna be key to conserving these trailing edge populations in the Southern Appalachian Mountains. This research has been going on since 2002 by Bob Cooper. I've been involved since 2013, but this can be a long-term effort, okay? We hope to do this for many more years to come, evaluate more hypotheses, and um, again, very appreciative of the interest from folks like you. Um, uh, we're gonna have some time for questions here in a minute, but I do hope you'll stay in touch. Um, if you ever wanna come visit the sites, we might be able to work that out, things like that, because it's really in your backyard. I and mean, we're talking about a 30 minute drive from Highlands is where this work is going on. Um, so thanks to you again. I also like to thank the graduate students once again. We have many people involved with the project, research coordinators, Every year we hire field technicians to help collect the data, undergraduates from UGA. We even get high school interns to come up there and help out. Um, so I'd like to thank all those people, the many um, agencies that are involved, including the funding agencies, National Science Foundation, Georgia Ornithological Society, and the US Forest Service. So with that, um, thanks once again, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Chandler. Uh, sounds like people are really enjoying the talk. And we have Kathleen Kennedy Hannon who popped in and she said she just wanted to say thank you. This presentation is so fascinating. I worked on the Black Throated Blue Warbler project as a field tech in 2010 and find these results just astounding. Incredible work. Oh, that's so great to hear. Thank you so much for chiming in. And uh, I'm sure if you don't know, Dr. Cooper's retiring this year. So you should stay in touch with them and, uh, and uh, stay in touch with the project. Excellent. Um, and if folks have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or Q&A. I have a question um, I'd like to kick things off with. 
kind of greedily. So as climate change affects the ranges that Canada warblers are for, or black to blue warblers are in now, mm -hmm. do you foresee individual birds deciding that area is no longer suitable and seeking new suitable habitat or are they site specific and faithful enough they'll hang on to that mountaintop even when they're not being successful in hatching? Yeah that's a great question and one of the amazing things about these migratory birds that I think surprises a lot of people is that the adults show extremely high site fidelity. So a black-throated blue warbler that nests in a particular location it migrates down to Cuba or the Dominican Republic, Jamaica and then when it comes back the next year, almost without fail, it uh, sets up a territory within 100 or 200 meters of where it bred the year before. So you're never, there's no evidence that a bird that breeds in North Carolina is ever going to disperse as far as even like Virginia or West Virginia and definitely not up to New Hampshire. Um, so that just doesn't happen. Now with the with the juveniles, so first time breeders, they show slightly more larger dispersal distances. So what we think could happen is that these birds, these populations could track their optimal climate conditions through juvenile or natal dispersal. Um, so that's one possibility that the population is able to shift through dispersal of the offspring essentially. Um, but that's a very hard process to study. And it's something we're, we're interested in, but it's going to take a lot of time, a lot more data to thoroughly evaluate. Well, one of the things, as you were mentioning bird banding, um, for those of you who may not know, we actually have a monitoring avian productivity survey field site here at the biological station um, funded by the foundation. And so it, one of the thoughts I was thinking was, well, if you're banding birds down in Coweta and we're finding those juveniles who are moving up those, those 30 minutes by car here to Highlands, it's entirely possible we could be eventually netting your juveniles up here. Yeah, if you ever see a banded black throated blue warbler or any banded species that uh, you, you suspect might not be from your study area, please let us know. Of course, the, the birds that are captured all get re reported to the bird banding laboratory. So any bird that's actually processed, we'll know about. And so far, we haven't had any evidence. No one has caught any of our birds from Coweta at other study areas. That's impressive. Um, not necessarily in a great way. Yeah. All right, we have uh, Melanie Malden is thank saying thank you. Uh, excellent presentation. Monty is as well. So thank fantastic. you so much for, for attending. We are very grateful to have you. Um, I'm and sorry that went a bit longer than I expected. Uh, I think the technical difficulties slowed me down. It's all good. I know I could easily keep asking questions for quite some time, but I think our audience is good. And so before we wrap up here, I do want to thank Dr. Chandler very much for speaking with us and thank everybody else for joining us. Oh, us. Technology permitting on our end, a recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube page by next Monday. Keep your fingers crossed. Um, if you would like to join us for our next two lectures, you can learn more and sign up on our website as well. And if you'd like to find out about our future programming beyond this climate conversation series, you can sign up for our e-blast on our website. We keep you guys up to date with cool things that are happening, including bird banding next week, which will be awesome. And if you'd like to support the foundation and programming like this, you can make a donation or become a member on our website. We greatly appreciate your support. All right. Thank you again, Dr. Chandler and everybody else. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks to you, Paige. Thanks, Winter. Take care, everyone. You too.